But next up, it is my great pleasure to introduce Jennifer Andres with Washington, Washington State University. And she is going to be talking to us today about the efficacy of Scotch broom biological control agents across Western Washington. So welcome, Jennifer. Take it away. All right, we're still muted. <laughs> Too many buttons to click here. Um, so uh, thank you, Alexis. Uh, can you see me? My screen is doing funny things now. Um, I think I'm OK. Yes, we uh, can so see Yesterday, you may have heard uh, Paul Pratt discussing the Scotch broom gall mite and um, Robert Bodie talking about uh, natural selection in relation to biocontrol in Scotch broom. And today, I'm going to talk about what our biocontrol agents are doing across the landscape in Western Washington. So just a little bit about uh, who I am, and um, I won't go into too many details, but uh, I do run the statewide biocontrol program. I'm based in Puyallup, but we travel all over the place. And we provide biocontrol support in a number of different ways. Um, this is, program is almost 100% almost funded by uh, the Forest Service and BLM as federal funders of many state agencies, um, tribes, and county weed programs. So we really wouldn't be functional in any way. In fact, we wouldn't exist without that, this funding. So the two primary biocontrol agents we work with on Scotch Broom are um, seed feeders. So we have Brucidius velosus, which is a seed feeding brucid, and Exapion fusarostra, which is a seed feeding weevil. So they're in the same niche. Um, again, they're feeding on the developing seeds. So neither of these insects are feeding on the seeds that you find in the soil already. So they are reducing the amount of seed uh, going down into the soil every single year. Um, so because of this, this uh, practice is really not compatible with other management techniques like mowing, spraying, cutting, or burning. Um, the way you want to think about it is that if you are reducing the pods and reducing the seeds or killing off the plants in some way or harming the plants in way, some way, you're also killing off the biocontrol agents. So that's really critical to know in, if you're thinking about putting biocontrol into part of your integrated weed management strategy. The other thing that's critical to know is that neither of these biocontrol agents are impacting current stands. So we don't really see any damage to the plants that are already out, uh, out there. So what we're really trying to uh, reduce are future populations of scotch brooms. So as our scotch broom start, um, plants die out, we will have less seeds to recruit from. So a little bit more about each bi of the biocontrol agents. Uh, so this is Brucidius velosus. Um, as plants were in bloom, it's, it's getting a little bit, bit late now. You could find the adults. Um, these are the adults. You can see they're quite small. Um, this is a scotch broom flower. Um, you can go out to plants that, and there may be still out there if they haven't died off, if you have anything in bloom. You can uh, beat the plants with a badminton racket onto a white sheet, and you'll see both of the biocontrol adult, um, agent adults fall onto that sheet. So what the adults are doing is as the pods are uh, starting to form, they lay their eggs into the pericarp of the seed pod here. And so you can see these tiny little whitish looking dots are all eggs of Brucidius velosus. So this is a great time of year to go out and look at your um, pods that you have out uh, as they're starting to form. You can really get a sense for how many, if you've got a lot of eggs on there, you can, you can really start to see them. So in uh, Washington, we have, um, so sorry, this insect was first released in Oregon in 1998. Um, in Washington, we've released over 650 releases. It's about 45 per year. It also does attack French broom. And I do have some data uh, down in Southwest uh, Oregon on the attacks on French broom. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but feel free to contact me if you're curious about what that looks like. So once the eggs, um, the larva hatch from the eggs, they will often create this sort of tunneling that um, you don't always see the tunneling, but what they're doing is they are now moving towards the seeds. So once they find a seed, they mine down into the seed and Brucidius feeds entirely within the seed. So it's to the larva is completely within that seed. So later in the season, you can go out when the pods are um, larger and fully formed, and preferably if they're starting to turn brown but not yet popped, you can see this sort of mottled uh, appearance. It's not a guarantee that um, just because you don't see modeling doesn't mean there isn't a beetle inside there. Sometimes you can have it look pretty healthy. 
um, and then uh, you'll find beetles inside there. But this is a good indication of what, what that looks like. So if you're curious, you can always stick your thumbnail through, um, through this, and if white juice comes out, you just kill the beetle. So once they're ready, they're pupate inside here. Oops, I'm sorry. They pupate inside here. The adults will uh, cut a little hole at the bottom of the seed and emerge from the seed. With Exapion fusarostra, uh, this is a weevil. And so the weevil is quite a bit more narrow and it has these sort of, sort of silvery white stripes on the back and it has a long snout. I'll show you some comparison pictures in a second. Um, you can also find these guys right now, but you will not see the seed uh, or sort of the eggs on the pods. So they um, actually embed their eggs into them, so you can't into the into the seed pod and into the seeds, so you really can't see them. So you're really going to be looking for adults, and then later in the season, you can they're really readily readily available um, to be seen because the larvae feed both externally and internally. So when you crack open a seed pod, you can really easily see a larva or a pupa because they're right sitting right in that half open um, seed. They also can attack both seeds. So they may um, mostly be feeding on this seed, but they do what we call peripheral damage to another seed, which we assume in many cases makes them unviable. So this one uh, was released in California in the 60s. So it's been around for a really long time. We don't see large numbers of it. We haven't done a lot of releases in Washington. And at this point we find it, but we don't find it, um, we don't find large numbers. So we're not really redistributing, redistributing it. So here's some um, comparison pictures between the two. This time of year, you could probably still find Brucidius, um, kind of little fat black beetles on the plants. And Exapion, you wanna look for something that's um, it, it just is a skinnier looking uh, insect with a, a longer snout. And again, these brown, brown with these stripes on its back really stand out. Later in the season, uh, as a side by side, you can see Brucidius is inside the seed and Exapion is outside the seed. So neither of these biocontrol agents uh, can get out of the seed pod uh, on their own. So they are uh, really relying on that dehissing nature or the mechanism that Scotch Broom uses. So when Scotch Broom is popping, that's how the beetles get out. So when I'm going through a scotch broom uh, patch in the in the later in the season and I hear pops all over the place, I like to think about it as those plants are releasing beetles, not um, seeds. It sort of gives me some comfort. So since we've been studying this program or, or this uh, project for a while, there's a couple of questions we were curious about what biocontrol is doing out there. So what is the percent seed destruction? And are we seeing those attack rates increase? Do we see differences in the numbers of Brucidius and Exapion? Is there a parasitism influence going on with either of those biocontrol agents? Do geographic or environmental factors influence the presence and impact? And can we um, accurately predict where biocontrol will provide some long-term management? So I've been working on this in Washington since 2012. So we've been doing this work from 2012 to 2019. The amount we can work on it really varies depending on how much funding and time we have. Um, so you'll see that reflected in the number of uh, sites in the data that I show you. But um, we have been doing this for a long time. And in 2014, we did the, a really big study um, where we looked at what biocontrol agents were doing across the whole distribution of Scotch broom in the West, um, Western North America. So that included Washington, Oregon, California, and British Columbia. And so what this looks like is um, in order to figure out these and, and answer these questions is we really have to do a lot of pod dissections. And so we collect the pods following a particular protocol and we um, dissect 90 pods per site um, where we're looking at things like total seeds, aborted seeds, what are our biocontrol agent proportions look like and how many are they killing and do we see parasitism? Um, so this is a pretty big, it, it's a lot of work. Um, we uh, about a site usually takes six to eight plus hours to dissect depending on how fast you are so it is a lot of work but i'm hoping the data is valuable in the long run so i want to acknowledge my partners from 2014 when we did the big study uh eric coombs and wyatt from oregon um susan from bc mike from california and i also want to take this opportunity to thank all the people who have collected pods and help dissect pods. Um, it's, it's lots of partners involved in all of this. 
So I talked about the data that we collected in the 2017 symposium. Um, so I, I, do, I won't really go into the details, but I wanted to remind you of some of the things that we saw. So again, we followed a really um, specific protocol. And in 2014, we, we looked at populations from the northern part of Scotch Roots Range in British Columbia down to the southern um, range in California. And this is really the densest area where Scotch broom lives. So I'm going to jump straight to the results since uh, I already talked about this a couple of years ago. Um, we found that annual precipitation was significant for predicting proportional seed damage. So when we had increased pre precipitation, we saw increased seed damage. But to our surprise, we didn't see that latitude, elevation, minimum temperature, or frost-free days had any importance in explaining our proportion seed damage. And so that was kind of an uh, interesting clue to us that we had more to work to do. There was a, a slight significant um, influence of pod length, where we saw decreasing damage um, when we had increasing length. We did see some st um, state differences and some site differences. So again, just as a reminder, this is kind of what it looked like. So in California, we really didn't see a lot of um, seed destruction. The rates weren't that high. Uh, we, you know, we see, you know, probably 40% attack rates, which isn't really great. Oh, wrong direction. Sorry. Uh, Oregon, we see really wonderful attack rates in this this valley region of uh, Western Oregon. So in sort of the inland area of Western Oregon. This has really been a, a, a great um, a great region for attack, but our coastal sites really didn't look all that great, or it was fairly inconsistent. In Washington and British Columbia, again, we saw a lot of that pattern where our interior sites looked pretty good. Um, we were okay, we're pretty good with happy with this. Um, this site in British Columbia was 98% seed control, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, so we were we were pleased with pretty pleased with this, but um, again, our coastal sites made us wonder what was going on. And so what we really did at this point was we started to think that probably some of it was just the fact that we needed to put a real emphasis into doing mass releases within this area. So Brucidius in particular is a is really good at distributing. It can fly quite well. Um, I uh, but with the prevailing winds coming from the west, it may not be so good at distributing itself out to these populations. Plus we have the Olympic Mountains here, which would be a pretty big barrier. So instead it might involve a little human intervention. And so we started doing some pretty big releases through this area. So we followed some of these sites um, when we could, um, and this is the data from 2019. So, um, so unfortunately, these sites have all been destroyed. I mean, that's great for Scotch broom control, but not for biocontrol in terms of our data. So we're looking at some other sites. So this is actually on top of this. Uh, this is 2019, where you've got the pink polka dot, um, and then the uh, blue and red would be 2014 data. So this is the site in Port Angeles, where you can see in 2014, uh, we really had about a 30% attack rate, which isn't great, but by Oh, sorry. I'm trying to see, trying to trying to see my own slide here. Um, but by uh, 2019, we are looking at uh, over 75% control. So this is a great increase in just a few number, few years. We were able to pick up a few new sites um, that we've been working on over the last few years, where we've done some releases, and we're looking at over 50% control um, of seeds in those in those regions within the whole region. Ho River region. This is a site down in Westport. Um, we didn't have great control back in 2014. It was about 20%, not even that. Um, and there's been some funky things that have happened to this site, but we are still we are seeing some increases in our attack rates. So now, as of 2019, we're closer to 60%. So we're on the, on the rise, and it looks like our efforts are working. Now this is an area down near Long Beach, uh, right at the, at the Oregon-Washington border. Again, not great uh, attack rates in 2014. And this is a nearby site where we're um, looking at almost 75% in, in 2019. So pretty pleased about that. Um, we've also been doing some long-term monitoring at some sites where we uh, the blue line is our percent attack and the uh, 
orange line is Exapion fusarostra and uh, gray line is Brucidius. And what we see is that once they build up, they're pretty stable at those sites. So the populations don't change that much. And we are seeing pretty high levels of attack at quite a few of these sites. I was also curious what the average attack rate and uh, looks like between years. So from 2012, and this is, you'll see the site numbers change depending on the year, you can see that we are increasing um, our average attack rates at most of the sites. But we have a lot of variability. So some of these sites are really great. We've got, this is a really nice attack rate, and others are kind of not so great, 6%, 7%, that kind of thing. Um, so what I was curious about is what if we remove the coastal sites? Because we know we've got work to do with the coastal sites and some things going on there. And so we looked at, um, so I removed the coastal sites from this data, and what we see is that we are still seeing that average on the increase but our variability is really different now uh, when we take up the coastal sites. Most of our sites are kind of getting into that average of 70 to 90%, um, 70 to 80% seed uh, control at those sites. So this is pretty encouraging and it might be where things stabilize. We'll have to see um, how that goes down the line, but um, I think we might be stabilizing a lot of these sites at, at about 80, 80% control. So there are a couple of, um, studies that and models that show what kind of seed control we would need using biocontrol in order to see long-term reductions of scotch broom and they're kind of variable so it's hard to a little bit hard to figure out how to fit our our stuff into these three different models so um, Shepard et al found that in a native grassland you would need 62 percent um, but a exotic pasture you would need 97 percent seed reduction Parker found 70 percent in disturbed up to 100% seed reduction in undisturbed. And recent painter found 75% of the seeds would need to be reduced. So again, it's challenging for us to know, um, our, all of our sites are a little bit different, different kinds of habitats, um, it, but it's difficult for us to know exactly how they'll fit in. But what we can say is that in 2019, seven out of our 15 sites had greater than 80% seed uh, reduction. And three out of 15 had greater than 70%. So both of these are falling within this model, within all of these models. Those remaining five sites were all coastal. And so again, that's, that's a, um, sort of a, a to be determined situation. So ultimately the way I always think about, Scott, uh, the way I'm thinking about looking at this data and the long-term um, work that we're doing, it seems to me that we are seeing pretty substantial reductions of seeds on the landscape. And, um, and I think that even though we might all be dead by the time we really see the uh, responses of it, I do think that biocontrol ultimately have a pretty imp strong impact in terms of scotch broom. So I and wanted to- minutes. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to take a minute to talk about our new biocontrol agent for, Scott, um, for Gorse. Um, this is pretty exciting because we don't get a lot of new biocontrol agents through. It is a little thrips. This looks massive, but it's actually really small. Um, and this is information provided by Joel Price with ODA and Fritzi Grefstad with OSU. Um, so it's a very tiny thrips. Uh, it, what they do is puncture the cells of a plant and they suck up the contents. Um, you can see, uh, it, this is just really a pretty miserable, tiny little thing to work with, um, extremely small, but the damage it can do can be pretty impressive. Um, especially on young plants. And so you can see this is a greenhouse plant, so it's going to be, um, the damage will be more extensive. You can see the kind of whitening it does as it, it sucks out those plant juices. So in 2020, they started releasing at seven sites um, near Bandon and Lincoln City. Um, and, and so they'll be following up on those sites. They've also shipped them to California. In Washington, we'll probably uh, be looking at potential sites for next year and uh, we'll see how that goes. So if you have sites in Washington, let me know. What, to, what can we expect? Uh, this is going to be interesting. Um, they, there is the potential for some predator problems. Thrips can be taken out by a number of different things, and so we, we expect that there will be some issues with that. Um, it seems like the thrip will reduce mature plants to some degree, but really it's probably going to go mostly go after the seedlings, and they're really thinking that there may be an opportunity here to uh, um, achieve control by cutting mature gorse and letting the thrips uh, attack the regrowth. 
So I just want to con conclude really quick by letting you know that we do have some resources available to you. Um, this is a, uh, I have copies of this book, physical copies of this book, which I would have brought if we had been able to meet in person. So if you want a physical copy, let me know. Otherwise, you can search iBioControl Publications and Scotch Broom, and you will find this uh, pretty beefy technical manual. Um, we also have a fact sheet, again, searching WSU Publications, Scotch Broom Biological Control should bring it up. So just let me know if you're interested in either of those things. And with that, um, this is my contact information, and I will also be hanging around for the panel, so feel free to ask me questions at that time. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jen. It's so weird when there's no clapping in between. I feel like so strange to shift that way. Um, but anyway, we're going to get moving right along. So 